So hi, Holly, how are you doing? Hi. I'm good, thank you. And so you pronounce your last name Holly Basley, right? Yes, yeah, okay. I'm so glad you got it right. <laughs> it's very rare, you usually get Baisley. <laughs> I appreciate that. So it's good to see you today. I appreciate that. And you have a lot of things to tell us about education. And so let's kind of jump right into the conversation, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sounds good. So some of the topics that we want to talk about today are attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD. And we're going to transition into uh, teaching methodologies and how teaching in the classroom right now is using an archaic model. We might want to think about using different types of models to just be current with the current mm -hmm. world that we live in and then talk about maybe some alternatives, uh, alternative methodologies or, or alternative models to the classroom. And then we'll talk about something that's near and dear to your heart, and that's gamification and game-based learning. So how does that sound to you? Sounds good, yeah. Okay, so let's get started. So first, just based off of your understanding, let's define the term ADHD. So in your perception or from your experience, what is that and how does it impact the classroom? Uh, well, it's a neurological disorder, which is still regarded in um, many science circles as sort of a mental health thing, although I, I see it more as a learning, I mean, they like to say disability, I'd say a learning difference, <laughs> um, which just means that, for example, your normal school day, sitting down all day, having to do very, like quite repetitive sometimes tasks can be really difficult when someone with ADHD is thinking uh, like a lot of different thoughts all at once going mm -hmm. on and wanting to sort of follow where their curiosity goes and often uh, it might be diagnosed really young but in primary school there's a lot more uh, sort of room for curious curious kind of thinking although that that's changing as curriculums become more and more stringent but as soon as you get to secondary school it becomes so test-based and this is sometimes where these students sort of stray um, away from being really good pupils but it doesn't mean that having it means you can't succeed or be a good student it just means that there's a lot going on that a lot of teachers and families might not realize so have you experienced students with adhd in 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 your setting or well let's start there and because i have got some follow-up questions yeah so uh i guess there's two things um i found out last year i have it myself <laughs> okay so okay. that that was a big thing in a sort of journey of discovery and doing a lot of research and since doing that i work in a school and um we i work as a sort of activities leader so we do art and sport and games with the kids but from that i can notice some of the traits where the kids especially who really can't st sit still when we when we do the sort of quiet time, time sit down housekeeping you know there's a couple of ones that maybe get in trouble more because they don't realize what they're doing is upsetting others i can sort of realize it but i'm not going around you know telling their parents for example as i'm not um you have to have a special like so, you know um official status to do that but um they're definitely the ones who have a lot of questions and are more curious and are quite fun i definitely don't see them as a uh, i see them as as a great addition to our groups <laughs> so you happen to mention that there are so, several challenges to mm. teaching students with adhd um can you can you identify any others you know they say they that they're always their, their mind is just running and so i think their, their body follows their brain in just terms of needing to be active uh what yeah. other challenges do you see in the classroom with um, you know, students um yeah i'm not because i'm not a traditional classroom i, I wouldn't uh, we, we often because we're doing sports so much we often get the kids running around which is really good so a lot of the time they aren't too agitated because we get them to you know run around but it's things like um, we serve food waiting their turn <laughs> when, we're, when we're doing that kind of thing maybe getting in trouble for talking back that kind of thing things that like are sort of normal kid behavior but sometimes they will like might maybe they might push it too far or whatever but there's always if you talk to them you know like an adult with respect and stuff it's always easy to come round um to a solution where you right. might sort something out where um you know okay yeah yeah i know i can understand that you want that thing from the cupboard or whatever but we've got to follow our routine 
you can come back to it and ask me later then I can give you to like that kind of thing just to make sure that they they understand they'll get it but they just need to be patient because you know if I give one child for example special treatment and get something from them for them all the other kids will want it so (laughs) it's kind of teaching them that little bit of patience sometimes (laughs) so you mentioned that you've been officially diagnosed with ADHD no I haven't officially yet um I'm on a waiting list which takes about (laughs) <laughs> okay two years but um in terms of like a lot I've yeah we're seeing like a a specialist uh counselor who sort of said that this would be a really good idea for me to get tested um and a few other friends who have it diagnosed have also sort of said oh <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> so <laughs> basically. Do you see, are you being impacted in any way re- regarding those possibility of of being ADHD uh I guess for a long time I was just sort of wondering and being like oh well no probably not um there was a lot of like imposter because I didn't think I I was, you see a lot of videos on the internet some of them might be true some of them might just be that's how everyone's brain works so I was often thinking like oh I don't really do that I'm not always late to everything only half the time so maybe I don't have it or you know <laughs> just dismissing it but I, I I've done things in my routine like if I have something really important before I will try and like take a nap just to sort of help my brain um concentrate and if I have like a time where I'm just like not asleep but for 15 minutes eyes closed it makes me so much easier for me to concentrate and um you know stabilize my mood that kind of thing that's so much more I realize affects my brain than I yeah I'd ever you know known before I sort of started doing this research So that's good. So you've learned Mm. to kind of develop some, uh, I guess, habits or uh, mechanisms to help you uh, really, and I guess is the best way to put it, stabilize your condition or at least work with your condition so it's beneficial. So you know how to make some adjustments throughout the day so it doesn't negatively impact your performance. And so, yeah, um, definitely, definitely make adjustments because I am tired, like I think 8% of the time. <laughs> I remember being at university and just complaining to my friend. He was like, you say you're tired every day. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just like working all the time. And it's just so, everything is so tiring from like when I get up to when I go to bed and now I'm I'm starting to be like oh maybe it's because there's so much going on and I'm trying to do so much that I need to just take take lots of breaks for my brain to sort of catch up with what's going on <laughs> and I think that's a good thing so yeah definitely a good thing <laughs> so let's go ahead and transition to mm-hmm. two of your favorite topics and that's teaching and that's uh, gamification so let's talk about teaching a little bit because mm-hmm. you suggested earlier that the classroom teaching model, and I think this is globally accepted as true, we're still using a model that's 100 plus years old, a uh, mm-hmm. fa- factory based learning model. And with our current state of affairs in, across the globe, you know, we, we're wanting to teach either project based learning or encourage creativity, intuitiveness. Mm-hmm. And things like that, which the model that we're using would not inspire at all. So how do you see, what, what is teaching like, for one thing? And then how do you see some possibilities that we could kind of change it to match the current needs for learning in the classroom? Mm, uh, it's a complicated question because it like everywhere you go, it's so different. Like, for example, in... I think it's Thailand and Dubai, they're trying out all these different kinds of project-based learning, which is more engineer almost based where like you'll have a topic and you're going to dissect that topic through loads of different activities, hands-on ones, maybe some writing ones, maybe one related to maths, and then you go about it that way. But the way the structure of the school works here is it's like, right, we're doing English, we're doing this particular author, we're going to sit down, read, um, and then I don't know write about something and that's kind of how all of the subjects are it's like right we're doing this write it down read it and um yeah for a lot of students I just I think that is limiting creativity but um it's also really hard to make everything hands-on so it's kind of like finding a 
balance between doing stuff that's sort of practical and quite fun and maybe gets the kids for example I remember in a science class when I was in year seven we went outside outside's like so so exciting <laughs> when you're a kid <clears throat> during lesson time and we went to study insects with like little tiny handheld microscopes and um you know we were counting things like the legs and uh, if they were invertebrates, all that kind of thing. It was it was really fun. I remember that lesson so well. I must have been like <laughs> 11 at the time. Um, and that really, re like, I really remember relating it to um, what we were doing at the time, studying insects. So it it really helped bring the context in. I mean, they say that a lot about learning a language. If you're not living in France, it's so much harder to learn French, for example, because you're not using it every day and you're not seeing it being used in a real world context. So it's kind of like, how can you make lessons seem more relevant, but also like not pressure the teachers having to do more than they already do? Because <laughs> I know, yeah, having done it for a long time, there's so much that goes on. So you you talked about remembering a very specific activity because you mm. went out and actually did something yeah so from the other things that may not have been impactful in your past growing up in school um did you not remember a whole lot and is it yeah, just I don't those, remember much <laughs> you don't remember much we're well, gonna i'm gonna take really? that out of the recording so uh, uh, no sorry. i'm only kidding we might keep it in if you want to. um no, i do so, remember being at school but i don't remember for example lessons uh i just remember that it was a lot of sitting down <laughs> and, I, and i think and, and that's really the point i, th I think you're right mm -hmm. i think we we uh, students and i have a daughter who's 11 years old just mm -hmm. tends to we're, we're in the we're in that moment we're in in that space, but we may be thinking of something else or five or six other things other than what the teacher is talking about. Because mm -hmm. as you said, there's no context to it. It's just either words coming out of somebody's mouth or words that we're reading mm -hmm. in a book um, and there's no structure around it. So it may make uh, learning a bit diff difficult. You know, we, we talk about, um, immersive learning or immersion you know put you put yourself in in that perspective and so i think that's what project-based learning really does and i i like it because it's agnostic of content you can you can really do some really good things um you know with that model but your model is is game-based learning and, and gamification yeah. which is a little bit different and so i've kind of been looking yeah, into it's... gamification <laughs> what's your perspective of of gamification so yeah, it's different to project-based learning, although you could sort of include it in a sort of project way that there is definitely like links you could do where you could, you know, learn the game and then see how the game applies to everyday life, that kind of thing. But the way that my games work is I often want to get the kids up and moving and then relating the games to everyday life. So I have a game called Reaction, which is about materials and reactions and uh, sort of chemistry for mainly primary, but it can be adapted to sort of year sevens and a bit older. Um, and I get them to hold these cards with things like the words wood and metal. And I first relate it to their favorite game, which is Minecraft. Um, oh. They always love when I talk about Minecraft. And I'm like, you know, Minecraft, you know, that we, we collect, you collect these materials, which are real world materials, although there's, you know, not everything in it is fully accurate. You don't have zombies running around. They, they are building things and they're spending, you know, a long time after school sometimes on these things. So it's good to sort of bring it into their own lives. And then I, I, you know, I'll get them to stand up and say if there's a child that's holding wood, I'll be like, OK, what around you is made of wood, you know, name some things. And then we think about the properties of that material. Is it a good building material? I have some amazing conversations with the kids when they have the card plastic because they always say plastic's terrible. We shouldn't be making more of it. It shouldn't be in the ocean. So it brings some really interesting conversations from what they're absorbing in their own lives that they really are anti-plastic and, you know, they're thinking about, you know, the sustainability of materials um, as well as, you know, wood lights on fire, metal rusts, that kind of thing. And it helps them to sort of relate chemistry to everyday life and think more about the chemistry is more than just molecules. It's kind of everything, you know, that's made up around us. I think that's so important. Um, 
than a normal lesson where you're just sort of writing down I remember like chemistry being in the classroom being like what are these things moles medium and mode I really don't understand like how does this relate to my what I'm going to have for lunch today and what I'm going to do when I go home <laughs> you know so yeah that that's one like thing and another game I have is something I developed weirdly before the pandemic but it's all about viruses and bacteria and how they um <laughs> come how we come into contact with them and you're basically going through a board and and collecting these viruses well not collecting but <laughs> unknowingly not meaning to pick up these viruses and bacteria question uh, infections and the students ask each other from across the board whether they would need to take antibiotics and it's a game that basically teaches students the importance of not misusing antibiotics which is another sort of issue that i'm very passionate about and again with that game i've you know related to other board games they might have played in the past like whether it's monopoly or ludo um and yeah that's something where i've played it with schools in sort of half an hour gaps and if they you know they always want to come back and play more they're always like we need to play longer i haven't finished i need to win you know <laughs> i really want to <laughs> do it and they the learning like it's still happening but they don't always realize it which i think is really good <laughs> So I think I think one of the values uh, that we hear about in terms of gamification or game based learning is uh, the engagement factor. The engagement is mm -hmm. higher than typical lecture uh, for students. And also uh, we infuse rewards as mm -hmm. not just, you know, uh, grades like a test grade, but, you know, rewards. Sometimes there's a leaderboard, you know, who's who's got the top score or second highest, third highest. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it kind of excites students to, to play, but in order to play, you've got to learn and demonstrate what it is that you're learning. So do you, mm. do you see those kind of things in, in your classroom? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. The reward stuff um, definitely helps. Um, and like when I give them feedback forms and stuff and ask them to do it, the majority of the time they're like, it was so much fun. Like, that's having the fun element there. I know it's like hard to get a balance between fun and actually learning stuff. So I'm constantly developing to make sure it's kind of, you know, the same fun and learning 50, 50, or at least <laughs> possibly maybe teachers might want 60, 40 for the, the fun side. But, um, you know, the, the learning is still taking place. And what's even more amazing is afterwards, the kids will then start to discuss how they could make and design their own games. So okay. there's creativity okay. that comes out of it. They could be like, wow, this game is so simple. Why don't you adapt it to be about pigs or I don't know, something they're interested in. And that's like a an extra subject, maybe like a not a subject, an extra uh, addition where they can go home and for homework, think about how can I make my own game based on something I'm interested in? And it's keeping that inquiry, you know, this kids are so inquisitive and keeping that really active when they're thinking about learning and, and almost like designing their own ways to learn would, would be amazing. Yeah, I <laughs> totally agree with that. that. Have, have you have you tried that as a homework assignment to kind of either individually or students working in pairs or small teams to kind of create your own game? Because then they have to, they're forced to, learn a bit more about the topic and then create a structure around that so that we can f reinforce it. I haven't yet, but it's something I am going to be doing. Uh, it's more of a, I want to do it towards the end of term. There's quite a lot of other stuff I have to do at the moment, but yeah, that's definitely something I'm going to be doing. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So you've mentioned two games. Um, does your virus bacteria game have a name? Uh, yes, it's called Biotical, the game of resistance. Oh, there we and go. <laughs> I made it before COVID and now I'm adding cards in with the different COVID-19 variants. Um, it was something when I used to explain it to kids many, many moons ago. Um, so I, I should bring this the context. I made it as an art student uh, when I was at university. Mm -hmm. I did this course called Interactive Art. So it was about making art that people could you know like communities school groups whatever into to sort of engage with so I made this game and um, it was really hard to kind of explain to kids when they came and played it at first but since the pandemic when I explained viruses and about them being all around us and picking them up well, they just know like instantly know <laughs> what's going on so it means within like 30 seconds to a minute they've kind of got the hang of the game and kids are uh, discussing this uh, recently, the kids uh, are happy to start playing a game and learn as they go, whereas adults want to have everything explained to them right at the beginning and a bit more like when I played it with my older relatives, a lot more resistant to learning, you know, new games. So it means that it's a lot easier to, you know, 
uh, have a game, start it up, and then I can move away, help another group. And then, you know, they're sort of teaching themselves and helping each other if one person in that group doesn't understand what's going on. That's that's a really uh, interesting perception that students mm. are want to jump in and start, you know, quote yeah, unquote, always. playing the game, and then they'll learn as they go. And and your experience is that the adults want to lay it all out for me, give me all yep. the parameters, <laughs> give me all the rules, give me. Yeah. So that's really yeah. interesting because that actually kind of is a little bit of con contradiction, contradictive of of role playing games, especially at start. And that's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart is, mm -hmm. you know, just start playing and, you know, learn, learn things yeah. as you go. It, yeah, I like that method. <laughs> because it almost it, it mimics life because you, you're at, at birth, you're not given all the rules of life. You learn as you go. And even as parents, we, we still learn and you're learning more about, you know, your own body as, as you grow older. Um, you know, having, you know, recognizing your, your ADHD things and such. So yeah, we're, yeah. we're always in the process of, of learning. So we can't have all the rules at the same time. Uh, <laughs> so that's a really interesting perception. Are there any other, so I was going to ask you, so you've got two games or are, are there any other games that you're really excited about using for your um, students? So I'm in the work developing games uh, with a friend this time, which is exciting. So it's not all on me, um, which hopefully means that we'll be able to do it quicker. We something we found at school uh, from being women was that when we were taught about our bodies and hormones and the menstrual cycle, that it was just very like one lesson, half an hour or maybe like do not get pregnant. This is how you shouldn't get pregnant. We were never taught about the impacts of the pill uh the impacts of hormones on your body how some hormones like estrogen and will come at certain times of the month and can be really beneficial to making you really uh, proactive and then some hormones will make you really tired and low all the time and we want to divide design a game basically about the hormonal cycle um to take into schools to help students you know learn about that because it's something that we feel quite angry about and we've been doing a questionnaire we've been running to sort of find out what people know and what they might want to know about and um yeah it's been really interesting it's something that's kind of hard to adapt to include 50 percent of the population to include guys but we're trying to figure out how we could include maybe like a uh, I don't know, an additional pack where it's like, this is testosterone going around the board kind of thing. <laughs> and the sort of flows that you have with testosterone, just so that it's, um, you know, we're not only, you know, uh, we're missing out on some people who can play. But if if we do get uh, men or people who who don't identify as, as either sex to play, then um, be really good because it will create those conversations around hormones and our bodies anyway and hopefully like make the taboo of um you know get getting your first period or whatever a bit less <laughs> a bit less of a taboo but yeah that's a project that we've only really recently started so i don't imagine it being finished until maybe towards the end of the year <laughs> so so what motivated that that's a really interesting project to to kind of think about yeah. Uh, both of us read a few books. Uh, one was The Pill Changes Everything and the other one was Period Power by, oh, I can't remember the author's names <laughs> right now, but you can Google both of those. Mm -hmm. And both of them were like, whoa, so there's so much research in those books um, about how, for example, the pill like affects your hormones, whether that's positive or negatively. Um, and it does a lot more than just stop your, your, your periods, um, which we both felt we both like went on it went off it sort of thing and felt like it had slightly negative impacts but i also hear that for some people it, it has positive impacts so it's kind of making sure we're not going into this biased and second the other one was thinking about like documenting uh your cycle to figure out when you're most productive and when you can for example plan 10 zoom calls in one week which i've sort of done this week and now i know next week i'm gonna need <laughs> a bit of a break um because yeah like the women's body clock is not designed for the same sort of 24 hours as men like we're active at different times like i often have a huge surge of energy in the evenings <laughs> which is like not great when you're trying to wind down to go to sleep but between around sort of three to sort of 7 p.m i'm like so 
are completely drained. And I don't know whether that's ADHD affecting it or just like my general who I am, but it's really interesting to, I'm now documenting every day sort of moods and general energy to see how it changes throughout the, the monthly cycles. So yeah, it's kind of a passion project from both of us. And we want more young girls to not be so afraid about like talking about it or thinking about it and um, not being afraid as well as like having big mood swings because they're just a natural, <laughs> a natural part of life. So I like all that. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. And it's really good that you're you're thinking outside the box and you're exploring new ways to kind of teach and uh, engage people in different conversations. That's really, really awesome. Uh, before we kind of wind up our conversation, are there any other thoughts uh, that you're inspired to kind of tell our audience? And then how can people get in touch with you? Because I'm going to leave that in the YouTube description box. So first, you know, what do you got other than this this other project any final thoughts um oh <laughs> uh it's a good question um i think it's just um whenever you're i don't know thinking about teaching or thinking about learning be open-minded to trying out stuff where you can get children to relate what they're doing to everyday life even if it's just one sentence you say like I don't know we've done stuff about clouds today go home and just look at the clouds for a couple of hours that's like a primary school activity right you wouldn't be able to do that with secondary school students but you know just something like that where they're like oh wow yeah you know I'm gonna think about clouds all night and that's like my homework whatever um something where it's just one thing that they can relate because I just found like a lot of the time when I was in school especially when you're learning things like maths, <laughs> it's so hard to relate it to your every day. Um, so yeah, that's probably it. <laughs> and then how can people get in touch with you? What's the uh, best way? So probably my email address, I check that regularly, which is inquiries at hybrid hyphen games.co.uk. Okay. Um, my website, which is www.hybrid hyphen games.co.uk that's currently um i'm remaking it but it, it is live i'm just <laughs> if you visit it that might be down for one day but i promise you it, it is there um or connecting with me on linkedin because i use that a lot for business um okay. uh, i don't tend to regularly use instagram but i'm trying to and yes and <laughs> youtube is something that i want to i'm going to be making more content very shortly so <laughs> excellent excellent so what yeah. i'm going to do is i'm going to put all of those contact points in the description yeah. So that at any point in time, you know, anybody who's watching this can get in touch with you. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. All right. 